Today we have the research highlights. There will be three sort of small lectures. Um, I'm kicking off with this topic, uh, but we'll not let you just get distracted. Uh, so Sana will take over, uh, and we have we aim to finish uh, this water break. She will tell us something about multiple uh, alignment uh, algorithms. And after the break, we will have Philip uh, presenting uh, something in systems biology. I'm sorry, I don't remember. The three papers uh, are online in the reading material. I hope you've all seen them. Who's read them? Good. Who hasn't? Not good. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, there will be at least one advanced question in the exam on the material from today's lecture. So if you're watching this later this week, then that's for you. Uh, the, the video's over there. <laughs> right? It will be exam material. Good. So that's clear. Uh, if either before or after the break, depending on uh, the timing, uh, we'll have some uh, pointers about how, what the exam will look like. Uh, but, um, okay. So. Um, oh. Sorry. Yes, I know. So I can turn it to black. With the push of a button. <laughs> it's because I've learned on the presentation course that if you want the focus to be on you, you should be the most shining thing on the stage. And the beamer is always brighter, so if you want to focus on, you, on yourself, you turn off the beamer. And then if you want people to look at it, it's fine if you turn it off. But uh, thanks. <laughs> okay, so, um, should I turn off the... I think I should. title of the paper as well. Uh, senior trees through the forest, sequence-based homo and heteromeric protein-protein interaction size prediction using random forest. Who's heard of random forest before? Who hasn't heard of random forest? So uh, we'll, we'll get to that in, in a minute. It's a machine learning method. Um, a very wide use. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a, a teamwork. Uh, Lynn Franken is a, a professor of biomedics at uh, Free University in Brussels. Uh, Jaap, you know him. I think you've seen him yesterday. Uh, I think you know this guy. Tim Howe <coughs> was a PhD student uh, with me for, uh, for a bit more than four years. And Paul de Geest was a master student who did his uh, internship on this project. So he ended up being one of the authors. So that, that's nice if you can do that in an internship. Uh, it's something to do. It doesn't always work, but uh, you can aim for that. Okay. Um, yes, and the, uh, the main idea is how to go from sequence data to predicting which residues will be on the interface of two proteins when they interact. So it's not about predicting if they'll interact or how, uh, how they'll interact precisely, but which residues are most likely to be part of this uh, binding interface by the two proteins. So why do we look at protein-protein interactions? Uh, this is my, uh, my favorite slide to introduce the topic. Uh, this, anybody recognize this picture? It's been in the Dutch newspapers a couple of years ago. You know what it is? All the proteins in the cell at any given point? Yeah, close. So it's not a whole cell. It's just a, sign, a, body, a butt of a synapse. So it's maybe less than a, a, a thousandth of a, of a normal human cell. Uh, and the, what they've done is they've tried to measure all known uh, synaptic proteins with uh, the quantities with uh, mass spectrometry, uh, the locations with fluorescently labeled microscopy, um, and the shape from crystallography, so protein crystals, 
and then they've made a sort of an artist rendering of to put all the shapes in the right amount in roughly the right places to make it look like a, a real synapse. Now, if you would build a car like this, you would have all the engine components in the uh, parts in the engine uh, uh, compartment. You would have all the chair parts in the seat in the passenger compartment uh, with the with the steering wheel on top, but none of it will be assembled. So the stuff is in the right place, but it's not correct connected uh, in the right way. Yeah, and if you've ever bought something from IKEA, you know this is not a trivial thing. And, that's, and then you have a manual to do it. So this is sort of this is the the, 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 the um, what is the word for that? The, the, the reason why you did this research, the motivation is uh, the motivation for my research line in, in the first project interactions. How how does stuff fit together so that it makes a working machine in the living cell? Um, and uh, so understanding interactions tells you how proteins work together. Um, <clears throat> it can also help you, in, for, for example, interpret. Uh, 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 SNP, so uh, single nucleotide uh, variations that you can observe between healthy and uh, diseased people or between healthy tissue and, and tumor tissue, for example. Um, and that's, that's the reason why I try to also predict things from sequence, because in those cases you don't uh, always or often you don't have any structure information. So you only have the sequence, you know there's something changed, and would it, it maybe be on the interface? And then and get some idea of not only what uh, that there is a variation, but also what it might be doing. Uh, it might also be true for if you if you encounter a new virus strain, those are typically have very many unknown proteins, so no homologs in no databases, you can't find any functional annotations, uh, you can't find any structures, so the only thing you have to work with you can work with is Okay, right. So um, just to define protein interactions, there's, you, can, you can talk about protein interactions at different levels. Uh, the most abstract one is one that, that Kimmen also mentioned previously, where you look at uh, correlations between evolutionary trees, and you, you pick up something like uh, uh, functional relations or influences, uh, but they're, they're, they're not physical. Right? So uh, A influences B, but you don't know how. It could be in very many different ways. It could also be indirect, that A influences C, C influences B. This could also be called an interaction between A and B. It could also be a mutual independence that, goes, that doesn't go in a cascade, but in a, in a, they're both dependent on C. In that case, you will also observe a relation between A and B. But A doesn't influence B. It's C that influences both. Right? This is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is physical interaction, so where the two proteins are actually in direct contact, so the structures actually bind together, it's chemical, well, not chemical bonds, as in covalent bonds, but it's physical chemical interactions of atoms meeting. Um, and there's two sort of main, main ways. Uh, you can have one protein uh, interacting with a different protein, we call it heteromeric interactions, uh, but there's also proteins that uh, make a dimer with uh, another copy of itself, so two of the same protein binding, and we call that heteromeric, uh, sorry, homomeric interaction. It could be a dimer, trimer, tetramers. There's, there's virus capsids, for example, that, are, that consist typically from dependent on the class of viruses, like the other class of viruses, where the capsid is built out of 60 identical copies of the same protein, and they make a very nice uh, uh, <coughs> symmetrical arrangement. So this can be very complicated, uh, but yeah, keep it simple. Okay, and what we predict is which positions, which residues in the sequence are most likely to be on the sequence. On the, sorry, on the interface region, right? Okay, <clears throat> is that clear? Good. Now, uh, where are we going? Right, so uh, I've already told you, so the, what we're using is a random forest classifier. I, I won't go into any of the details, because this is not a lecture on uh, machine learning techniques. There are optional courses on machine learning and so on uh, later in the year, uh, but it's a classifier. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a whole number of different kinds of classifier methods in the machine learning uh, arena. Uh, and random forests are uh, quite insensitive to overfitting. And they work reasonably well with default parameters. And I'm not a machine learning expert, so this is the main reason why I chose random forest. Because it's, just, it's very hard to do things terribly wrong with random forest models. 
uh, sort of more advanced machine learning methods uh, that actually require uh, much more in depth knowledge to, to avoid you doing things wrong. Okay, uh, so that's what we used, but any classifier needs uh, input. Need, and in, in, in machine learning, we call these features. So those are the, the data that go into the, the classifier for the training phase to train it, but also for the prediction phase to actually base the predictions on. So what are what would be uh, data that we have available from a protein sequence that we can give to the classifier as features? Any ideas? The sequence, yes. And anything else? Sorry? Charge. Charge, so let's, let's make that more general. So physical chemical properties, like uh, small, large, hydrophobic, hydrophilic. Uh, um, there's, there's indices for that, there's like the charge. Uh, whether it's aromatic or, or not, yeah. Put that in, yeah. Anything else? Uh, okay, but if we do it sequence based, where do we get the structure information? Well, we could be lucky and we can find the envelope, right? So then we have some structure information. Uh, but there's also methods that can predict secondary structure from sequence quite, uh, quite accurately. There will be. Mm, I don't remember. There, there used to be some, no, it's it's not in sequence analysis course. It's in structural bioinformatics course. There's a lecture on secondary structure prediction methods. Sorry, there was something else. Uh, yeah. Training set. The training set. Yeah, but the training set is just a set of proteins that you uh, that you train on. Uh, for for those proteins, you still have to have these features, right? So that so that's it's a different that's definitely needed, but it's not it's not features per se. It's what you get your features for. Or from. Um, okay. Anything else? Maybe uh, something like solvent excess. So tertiary structure would be nice because then you can see which residues are on the outside, and that makes it easier because residues on the inside are very unlikely <laughs> to be interacting with another protein. Uh, but let's assume that we don't have that because if you have that, there's actually methods that use structure and sequence to predict interfaces, and they're much better. But, so this method is for not having a structure. But the next best thing is you can actually predict which residues are more likely to be on the outside of the protein. And it's called solvent accessibility. You typically have a score, like a percentage. Uh, so you can actually predict secondary structure, you can predict solvent accessibility. Um, anything else? So let's say functional annotations. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a very good idea to include those. We haven't done that actually. Uh, you don't always know that, right? So if you have, if you're just looking at, a, let's say you're looking at a new virus strain or a completely new virus, then you might not have any information about the function of these proteins. It could be completely new, or most of them are typically completely new because it's a new virus. So you might not have any functional annotations. Or even function annotations of, of near enough homologs to say that makes some sense. But if you have them, obviously you want to. Yes. Okay. There's one thing that you haven't mentioned, but it's been in almost all the lectures up to now. Yes, evolutionary conservation. I, I'll generalize it a little bit. You might want to use a profile, not just your input sequence. But you, you make a profile with BLAST, and then you can see which residues are conserved. If they're not conserved, you can see what kind of variation there is. That might also tell you something. We know that tells you a lot, actually. Okay, good. So, I think we've done all this. Uh, so, so, the first thing is that distinguishing buried from exposed is relatively easy. So, we can do it. So, the features that we've used is conservation. There it is. But you have to have a profile to be able to calculate. Conservation, calculate conservation from the uh, Solvent accessibility and secondary structure, you can predict that. There's a method called NetSurfP, there's a new version of that, there's some other methods as well that uh, might be slightly better. Uh, but this was the one that we could, when, when we did this work that was available, we could actually get it, download it, and get it running. All the other ones that were probably better, like there were five that were, that were reported to be better. Uh, we, we either couldn't get them at all, 
uh, or we could download something that didn't work. So, anyway, that, that's a very typical use case. If you're looking for a good method, your first five on your list typically are not accessible or not working. <coughs> Uh, there's also something else that uh, has a little bit to do with structure, but it's a prediction method actually from the group of Bill Franken in, in Brussels that I mentioned. Uh, it predicts backbone dynamics, or flexibility of the, of the backbone locally. Uh, we also put that in just to see if that actually uh, brings any information. Okay, and, and we put in protein length. We'll come back to that later. Uh, but it's, just, it's a different one because protein length, of course, is not dependent on the position. All the other ones have a different value for the position. Protein length is just protein length. But it, 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 we will see that later. Okay, so which data set? So this is features. Then we come to data set, and then we, that's, that's your point. We need a test set uh, and a training set. Well, first a training set, then a test set. Uh, and we have a, a set of homodimer, uh, homodimer proteins that we split up into, uh, into a training set and a test set. And we have a set of heteromers for which we did the same. So heteromers interact with the protein and the homers interact with themselves, basically. Okay. Clear? Yeah? Then, uh, evolutionary information. Conservation is one of them. Uh, so, you run BLAST. Uh, it's as simple as that. It's usually good enough and it's, it's nice, nice and fast. You align them, the sequences. Uh, and then what we also did, in, in addition to just looking at the variation of the sequences, we also wanted to look at the variation of the features. Because uh, the residue in your query protein might be predicted, solved, and accessible, but then if you look at uh, predictions for, uh, for the homologs, they might, most of them might be not solved and accessible. So then either the prediction for the, for the uh, query protein that you're interested in uh, is wrong, uh, or uh, it is atypical in its family. It's, it, the other ones have a slightly different structure. There. And you hope that the, that the training set contains enough information that the random forest model can, uh, can actually find these patterns that, uh, that are there. Uh, that's always the problem when you use machine learning methods because you can, you can easily see how good it's doing in an overall prediction, but it's very hard to figure out why or how predictions come about. Why, why does it not predict this one correctly? Why does it predict that one correctly? Uh, those things are actually quite hard to figure out. But that's uh, the, the black box problem of most machine learning methods. Okay. Um, right. So, so we have for each uh, feature, we have three values. The value that was predicted for, the, uh, for that position in the query protein. Uh, the average across the homologs. And the standard deviation across all those, because we didn't want to put in like 50 different or 100 different values for each of the uh, individual uh, homologs. We just put in the average and the variation. Uh, so this, this, the average is, is like a typical value for this feature in the protein family, uh, and the uh, and the standard deviation is, is a variability or the conservation of that feature. Right? So there's a difference between the conservation of the sequence itself and the conservation of uh, its properties and structural properties. Uh, that can be different, right? So you can have variation in the sequence while the structure is being conserved. Okay, good. Now, how does this work? Uh, before we went into the complete uh, random forest model, putting everything in, we also wanted to know what, what each of the features sort of add to the prediction. So we started off by using individual features. And uh, you all know what the rock plot is and what the area under the curve of rock plot is. And uh, if you see this, what is your conclusion? It's almost random. This is not significantly different from random. So if you only use entropy, so that's a measure for sequence conservation, or you only use the predicted uh, backbone dynamics, uh, it's, it's random. Yeah? This is the standard deviation across uh, multiple training, training uh, multiple predictors that we train separately. Uh, and so this is not significant. 0.5. But if you combine these and you add the protein length, then you get actually something that's not good, but it's not random anymore. Yeah? So it's getting better. So two features that are in itself uh, only predict random combined actually yield more information. 
so in the, in the rock plot, it looks like this. It's the blue line. Now, then we can do some more. We can add a window. I'll have some more about that in the next slide. Uh, just the entropy length and window. That, that also brings it above random, which is also interesting. So window, you actually take the value for uh, a few residues before and through a few residues on. So you also have a uh, You can do the same for the dynamics. That's actually even better. This is also about, this is actually better than at using <coughs> conservation and dynamics. And this is the problem. We, we can only see that these differences exist. It's very hard to understand why that might be the case. Yeah, but these are things that, uh, with a bit of patience, you can try to figure that out. It would be a nice uh, project to be uh, a follow up on uh, this one. Okay. So uh, if you combine all these three, so conservation, dynamics, length, and a window, and you cross the, the sort of first magic barrier of 0.6, yeah? then you're well away from random. It's not good yet, but it's also not bad anymore. Uh, I don't have that one in the plot. Uh, if you only use solvent accessibility, you all already get close to 0.6. Yeah? So just knowing which residues are on the surface and which are buried, that, that already helps. And that's easy to understand because uh, most residues are actually buried. And the interface is, a, is, is not a huge fraction of the surface. So if you just predict all the surface to be <coughs> inter interface, you already have a, not a bad prediction. Yeah? If you just say, well, everything that's in the core can't be in the interface, that really helps basically uh, trim down your uh, false negative uh, predictions. OK. Then uh, we combine something more, so we do uh, conservation <coughs> dynamics and uh, uh, solvent accessibility, then we get 0.64, that looks like this in the rock plot, that's a nice step up. And then uh, if we add, also add a predicted secondary structure, then we get close to 0.7, that's the next magic barrier, right? So it's not 0.7 yet, but this is really uh, a nice step up again. So this is the top. The top. So how do we improve further on this? What other tricks that we can still use? take this last one, what have we not used here? I, something that I've actually already mentioned. Hmm? Yes, no? I think I heard something that's in the right direction. The window, yeah? So this one doesn't include the window. Uh, this one did. Yeah. So would that help? Uh, where are we going? Uh, yes, so if you take all features, uh, then you get this 0.666. Another magic number, but it's a different story. Um, if you then add a window, so you could take the four residues before and the four residues after uh, the central position in the system, then uh, you, go, you get 0.71. These, these, and it's very important here to highlight that these uh, scores are all on the independent test set, not on the training set, because then you might be overfitting. Yeah? That's one thing. The other thing that's important is what if you have homologues between your test set and your training set, would that skew your results? What do you think? It would, right? So what happens in that case, I, we actually had this in, the, in Paul's uh, 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 first version of his rock wall. It looked like this. <coughs> so you have your uh, positive rate, true positive rate, And uh, it looks like this. Can you explain that? Maybe this, I'm not sure, but maybe this is the random line, right? Maybe this, was this example somewhere in the project uh, documentation? I've seen it somewhere before. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've seen it, I, 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 So what happens here, these are the proteins in your test set that are homologous to some in your training set. So they're very similar to what the, the, the predictor already saw before, so they're easy to predict. Right? This is parallel to the random line, so these are apparently, this is just random. And these are very different from anything that the predictor already saw, so they're basically impossible to predict. Yeah? So if you see a rock plot like this, you can, without any doubt, say overfitting. Yeah? This is overfitting. 
the, the, the fact that you have this first set, which is really, really, you have this kink in it, right? If you go smooth, it's fine. But if it's a kink, then you have a set that's too easy to predict. That means you know in, indirectly in this case, because these are plots on So we filter them out, and then you get the rock plots that I just showed you on the previous slide. Okay. Um, I should not take too much time. Uh, so that gives you 0 0.71, adding the window, right? And the next thing to do is a trick out of machine learning. There's actually way more non-interface positions than there are interface positions. And that means that the, uh, the predictor can cheat by predicting more things. Uh, uh, that machine learning people say you predict, you over-predict the majority class. So if most things are, most are uh, interface, but not interface, then you, if you just predict a little bit more not interface, then you, on average you'll be a little bit better. But that's not what you want to do. You really care more about the interface positions to get them right. So the trick, there's two tricks. Uh, what we did is actually just throw away uh, randomly non-interface positions, uh, so uh, to the point that you have this, the same number of each. Yeah? Sounds very crude, but all the, all the predictor needs is enough examples of what a normal interface position looks like. Yeah? And if, if the patterns are still there, then it will work. So that's ba this is called balancing. So you have the same number of, uh, of uh, true examples and false examples, interface positions and normal interface positions. And you see the prediction gets a little bit better. It's not a huge step up, but it's... Oh, yes, window. So if, if you go if you go along your sequence, right? And this the predictor just for each position individually it says yes, it's an interface, no, it's not an interface. We're looking at an individual position here. Right? That this is the one we're predicting for. So this gets the number in the end, which will be let's say 0 0.6. It's something like the probability that it's it's a, it will be it's likely to be an interface. If it's above 0.5, you said okay, this is the uh, the window just means that you take not just the single position as input, but four positions, minus one, minus two, minus two, minus four, minus two, minus three, minus four, around this position. And you take all the features here, so the secondary structure, the solid accessibility, uh, the dynamics, the entropy, all these uh, features for, for each of these uh, positions there are nine times more features as input. Yeah? But also much more uh, material to find patterns in. Good point, thanks. Okay, uh, so that's the window, the balancing. Okay, now the a area under the curve of the rock is not the only uh, way that you can compare methods. Uh, well, this is just variation of the methods, but that, that, uh, it's really different for This is just, you can also calculate significance for rock walls, but this is a different point. Uh, you can also look at just the accuracy, the sensitivity, precision, uh, specificity, and the F1. Look in my lecture for the benchmarking lecture uh, for the definition of each of them. I'm pretty sure that one is in there, but I'm not sure. Uh, these are just different ways of benchmarking. And typically, if you want to publish a benchmarking paper, uh, people want to see a table with all of them in. Because if you want to have a method that predicts few positions, but very, with a very high likelihood to be correct, then you want to look at the accuracy. If you, if you want to have a high coverage, uh, and you don't care if there's, there's a bit more errors, then you want to look at sensitivity, and so on. So there's different things that you might want to stress uh, with these different methods. Okay. These are just the same four rows, which is different metrics. Okay, uh, in the rock plot it looks like this, and uh, so this is the point 0.72 that I just showed in the table, and the other two lines are two, old, two other methods that uh, are the only two published methods, at least at the time that we were doing this work uh, a few years ago, that only use sequence information. There were a lot of methods that actually they claimed they were sequence-based, but then they actually looked up secondary structure from the pre-DB. Well, then you use sequence, then you use structure information. Like there were a lot of iffy things. Uh, and, well, it's clear to see that they, they don't do very well, right? 
And this is the this is a precision recall plot. Uh, it's not important yet. The, the details uh, I've explained it in the uh, benchmarking lecture, uh, but you can clearly see that the, uh, you have the same trend. In the now, what one of the reviewers for the paper said this this is an unfair comparison because these methods were trained on heteromeric interactions, so two different proteins interacting, and our method is trained on homeomeric interactions, and the, the, the reviewer claimed. Everybody knows that these are very different. So, well, I don't know that because it's just all minor essence interacting. The, the evolutionary history is different because protein interacting with itself has only one sequence, and two different proteins interacting have two different sequences. So the evolutionary background could be different, but the physics should be the same. So why would this not work? But to be fair, we also did it the other way around. So uh, we compared our homomeric trained predictor on their heteromeric test set. That's an art principle, confusing maybe, but now we're, we're actually testing on their test set. And we also we ran their method on their test set, so we could be sure that we could get better result. And uh, we're still better, but the difference is, is way less big, right? It's still better, a little bit. Then we thought, oh, but wait a minute. Uh, can we do even better if we train on their training set? And the answer is yes, we can. So the red line is a new predictor. So this is the previous one I showed. Uh, this is a new predictor. It's tra trained in exactly the same way, the same random forest model with the same features, but on the heteromeric training set that the cyber people use. Right? And then it gets better for heteromeric uh, predictions. OK, and the precision recall shows the same. Now, now we have two different me methods to predict two protein, different kinds of protein interactions, the obvious, the obvious next step is to see if you can make one predictor that binds them all, uh, that, that works well for both, right? So let's see if we can do that. So I don't have a rock plot for that. I, I do, but I didn't put it in the slides. Uh, these are just the previous ones. You can, you can recognize the uh, performance metrics here. Uh, and we train a new one combined on the combined training set. And we test it on the uh, this is the homomer, the homomer interactions, homomeric interactions, and the, the bold ones are the highest number in the column. Uh, and so this one is actually for the homomeric predictions is even better in, in all the in all the future, in all the performances. So these are the previous ones. These are the homomers. If you test it on the heteromeric uh, data set, then it, the, it's a bit more mixed. Then the heteromeric trained predictor is actually slightly better. Uh, so if you don't know, you use the generic one. If you know that you definitely know you're interested in heteromeric interaction, then you can take the specialized uh, for the heteromeric. You, you don't ever want to use the homomeric predictor because it's the worst one in all this. Okay. Now, so that's nice. Uh, Cypher is uh, more or less at the bottom in all of that, except for the recall. So it has a higher recall than, than, um, than our, our variation. Okay. Uh, if you then look at which sites are predicted to be in the phase, so you can just make a, a set comparison of all the predicted sites. These are the true ones, those are the ones that are in the PDV crystal structure, they're actually on the interface, so we know the, the thing of what they are. This is what Cypher predicts, this is what we predict. Uh, the first thing you can see is that we predict way too much interface, okay, because the circles are much more, are way bigger. Uh, there's, there's, there's some bit of overlap, uh, but there's, there's quite a, a, a big discrepancy between the predictions of Cyber and our predictions. So there's a lot of sites that Cyber predicts to be interface. Some of them are actually correct. Yeah? And there's also quite a lot of sites that we predict that are also that, that Cyber doesn't predict, uh, that are also correct interface. Right? Um, so, um, there is some complementarity, right? So there's there's stuff that we can predict that they can't, and there's stuff that they can predict that we can't. Okay. There's also stuff that we both predict wrong. Well. Not a lot of stuff. But this is not not a perfect method, but it's very hard to probably. Okay. Um, should we wrap up? Okay, I have another okay. This is the features that uh, so uh, once you once you have your method. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once you have your method, 
your, your, your sorry, not your, yeah, your method, but I mean your uh, trained random forest model, you can look in the model uh, on the on the parameters that are trained and uh, identify how important the different features turn out to be for the prediction. Uh, you can do this in many different ways. Uh, this is one way. It's important to see here over here. It's important. Um, and this is, uh, so they are ranked in order of decreasing importance. So this one is the most important. I don't know if you can read it all the way in the back. But this is the protein length. Uh, so protein length is the most important feature. One of our reviewers told us, yeah, the length count, it's, it's the same for all the positions. So how can it ever help your predictor to say this is the interface position, but this one isn't? Because they're both of the same length. Length of protein. And then we said, well, we don't, we're not sure, but it's the most important feature, and we actually tried, if you take it out, the performance goes down. How, why would that be? Any idea? What does protein length tell us? Maybe the amount of protein that can be or amino. Yeah, it's close to that, right? So if you if you imagine that to, to the, the amount so there's a minimum size you need for an interface to be stable, because if you make it smaller, it's not sticky enough. Right? A small magnet doesn't stick as, as good as a big one. Yeah? Um, but there's also a maximum size of an interface, because if you make it too big, it will stick to anything. And that's not a good, you remember the picture from the start, that's not a good thing to be a protein in the cytosol, in the cell, that sticks to everything. It will aggregate, it will kill the cell. Yeah? So, uh, so there's a maximum size to the interface. It means if you have a very big protein, the interface is a relatively small amount of uh, uh, residues. So we think the predictor uses the length as a proxy for the protein size, so it should predict relatively fewer uh, residues for this protein. Uh, whereas if you have a very small protein, then uh, maybe half its surface, well not half, but a quarter of its surface could be. Right? So length would probably help the, uh, the methods to compensate for the size. Okay. Now, then you see uh, a number of um, this is solving accessibility, this is dynamics, this is uh, predicted pr secondary structure for the input protein, for the query. Uh, this, is, this is the same, uh, so dynamics and uh, solving accessibility for the average, for the, uh, the homologs, remember, from the from the profile, from the box. And this is the standard deviation of those. So we see all of these different uh, representations of the evolutionary context of our uh, problem of interest. We see them back in, the, in these features. Uh, why this is, how, and how they're used, this we haven't figured out yet exactly. But there's some, we have some ideas about that, but it's uh, that's still working progress. Okay, so. Um, I don't think I put in some slides from Henrietta, but uh, I don't think we have time. They're both in there, I think. These are, these are both in there, I think. Yeah. yeah. So you have to understand what these, well, you know what a rock bolt is, yeah? uh, and, and, but you have to understand how the predictions of the interface, non interface, and the true, true, false positives, and, and uh, true and false negatives end up in the, uh, in the figure. Um, that's the point five that I mentioned when I explained this. So, so random forest classifier gives you a, a, a prediction value, and the, the, the default threshold is point five. So the higher it is, the more likely the, the random forest model thinks it is to be interface. Um, and uh, the default threshold is point five. So if you set the default threshold, then everything above point five is predicted as interface. But to make the rock plot, you do the same trick as for blast. You 
you go along your score. In this case, it's, it's the random forest specifier score. You start with the highest. Yeah, it could be maybe 0 0.61, right? And so that's the one here, and then you go along the sorted list of, uh, of scores. Uh, and you, you score each of them as being either a true positive or a, a false positive as you go along the, the list. Of, uh, yeah? Yeah? Okay. Very briefly, uh, we tried this predictor, or actually Henrietta tried this predictor on uh, antibodies, and uh, this is the rock wall. So this is close to random. You can show that in different ways. Uh, but what she also did was train a new classifier, uh, and then it looks like this, which is not random anymore. Right? So if you take the old one to, that predicts protein interactions, it cannot predict where an antibody would bind. Antibody is also a protein, so it's technically protein interactions. Apparently they work differently. But it's still intrinsically more difficult because if you train a new one on the antibody data, you can actually predict it uh, with 0.7, which is really good. Okay, that's it. Uh, this is something more details. Okay, so we can predict protein interface from sequence. We it includes the evolutionary neighborhood. Uh, there's actually a web server, so if you want to try it out, we'll take the protein or have. Uh, it's not fast, but uh, it works. Uh, it works for homodimers and heteromers. Uh, this hasn't been done before, at least as far as I could find in literature. Most people just work on heteromeric interactions because they say that the homodimeric interactions are too different. Well, not in our hands, but I don't know what we do differently. Uh, and we're better than, well, we were better than the other system. There's a couple of new ones now that are actually uh, slightly better, and we're trying to figure out why and whether we can do even better than they. Uh, okay. Uh, if you have structure, don't use this method. There's other methods that use structure that are way better. So this is for when you really don't have any clue about this. That's it for me for this day. Thanks. If there are no further questions. I don't need to run yet. structure will be the same as previous years. The only difference will be that it's not on paper, but it will be on test vision. And for those of you in the programming class, you've already uh, worked with test vision. Right. And uh, for those of you who are doing this course for the second time, I, I uh, we have learned from the test vision uh, structure by mechanics and by mechanics. So we've made a few silly um, so, what we have is, um, so there will be uh, three basic questions, which will be half the points, and there will be, you know, write it down? Yes. You want to write some questions? Okay, so we have uh, three basic questions. which will be uh, half points, so let's say uh, 50 points, right? And then there will be three advanced questions. Oh, sorry, this is 60, 40. 60, uh, 40. Now, pay attention. For the master students, you need to do two out of these three. For the bachelor students, you pick only one. And it means that for better students, also only 20 points. So it's two more Yeah? So the basic questions are, well, you can see it from previous year's exams. They're all online on Canvas. If you can't find it, ask one of us uh, or one of the other students. Uh, the, the basic questions are more about reproduction of, of the material that, that you've been uh, have been uh, lectured. So the basic, the basic questions we um, we expect um, anyone who's followed this course to be able to answer without too much trouble. That means it's also quite predictable. So it's really the core material of the uh, course. So it will be um, 
some of the algorithms you've seen, look at the past papers, and you'll probably see which algorithms, so there's those two algorithms that have been handled in depth, and then of course there's the kind of project, um, yeah, so about Blast and the databases, um, that is also kind of core material. So these are the questions you may expect in the basic questions. So compared and to previous year's exams, there will not be big uh, uh, surprises there, there will be obviously different questions, but you have to get the details right. Yeah? This is stuff you have to prepare for if you can get it wrong. And then in the advanced questions, we typically give you a very new type of information. So you may actually, we may give you a plot you've never seen before. Yeah? And then we ask you to analyze that with the knowledge you have on this course. So um, don't be worried if you see how I haven't revised this. Um, that's quite typical uh, for one of the advanced questions. We'll actually give you new information and you have to apply that what you've learned uh, in the course. And so these will typically be a bit harder. And um, also, because you're on the exam, that's also the reason why you're allowed to choose. If you just don't see it on that moment, you still can leave one of the three out. Yeah? We'll have more on this next week in the question now. Right? So we also want to, we want to give you now already some idea of what you're doing. So before the question hour, it's a really good idea to look at one of the past papers um, already to get a bit of a feeling of what the exam will be like. Um, Papers is UK English for exam. Oh, sure, yes. <laughs> that might not be obvious for everybody. <laughs> and, um, good point. Uh, so, of, of the past exams, and um, you should also try and revise already, or at least look back at the lectures you found most difficult, so you can ask some questions about those. Yeah? So, you can ask us questions in the question hour, about any of the uh, lectures. How are we going to do it, Anton? Are we going to do it with the discussion yes. forum? Yes. Okay. Just yesterday I've opened a discussion forum on Canvas. Um, post your questions there. Yeah, what we will end, like the other questions. So if you think, oh, I have that question too, like it. But what we will do in the question hour, we'll go through the list of posted questions assorted by the number of months. So if you want to hear the answer to a particular question, put it there. Make sure that a couple of your uh, fellow students also are interested in a question and like it. Typically, <coughs> you need only two or three likes to get to the top of the list. But then you're sure that you, uh, your question goes up first. Uh, also, it's a very good exercise to try and answer some of the other people's questions. Yes? So if you can find the time for that, the people who did that in previous years, without a fail, ended up in the top 5% of, uh, of the grades. Now, this doesn't mean that answering questions gets you a high grade, it could be the other way around, but if you understand the material, it's easier to ask the questions, right? But trying to answer the questions is a very good, probably the very, very best way to prepare for the exam. Um, yeah, so we will favor questions with which already have an answer uh, to, uh, to go over the answer in the question hour first. Yeah? So if you really want your question to be answered, uh, make sure somebody else puts an answer there. And then we can see if we give you an even better answer. Clear? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering what we do with the bachelor students. So the bachelor students can actually look at the fundamentals page and see the questions, um, but you should be able then to post it, so I'll, I'll post, uh, also uh, put up a discussion form on the uh, principal's course, um, because you won't be able to post that because you haven't yeah. logged in, so we can uh, yeah, we'll look put at questions the, there, so uh, we'll make sure, if, I, if you don't remember next week, remind us to also look at the principal's uh, questions next week. Yeah, yeah? Because we did this differently. Yes, uh, that, those have been unfortunately delayed. They, uh, they've been delivered to Langert yesterday, mm -hmm. and he will be grading them soon. But I, I can't promise you a, a, a particular time frame. Okay. But uh, my apologies for the delay. Uh, but uh, yeah, it will be as soon as possible. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking on whether I need this with you or... Yeah, I have a 
doctor's appointment, so I have to go there. Come back later. For those of you I won't see before the program goes, they will be there at the start, and uh, I'll be there. So we'll do a small break. I, I have relatively have only 10 slides, so we'll do this relatively fast and then we'll have a small break and then uh, Philip will do the last uh, highlight about metagenomics. So it's actually uh, also bioinformatics and it's the biology combined. That's nice. All right, so first, um, this highlight will be about um, multiple sequence alignment, which is something I think you haven't seen yet, right? Have you seen multiple sequence alignment as an algorithm in any of the courses? No? Right. So um, this is, of course, a natural extension from the paranoid sequence alignment and dynamic programming uh, that you've seen earlier. Bas explained this, I think, in a lecture, so you have this dynamic programming matrix, remember, with all the arrows you have to fill in, um, and that way you can align two pairwise uh, sequences. You can also, also do this for multiple sequences at a time, and that's multiple sequence alignment, we'll see that in a minute. Um, but um, here, 